So I began by uh, suggesting that we think of our retreat as a form of the uh, Celtic monastic tradition, which is one of the most uh, vital and inspiring uh, traditions of, of Christianity, <coughs> and one that has a great deal of contemporary appeal, I think, to us. And, uh, <coughs> of course, the Celtic monastic tradition, this idea of the skeet, for example, where the monks, uh, the members of the community will live uh, separately but come together in a rhythm, sort of diastole and systole each day, coming together and moving apart, as we're doing in a simple way. Um, this tradition, of course, was part of something older, and it's a, 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 a remarkable uh, historical phenomenon, really, that the influence of the early Egyptian monks, the, the first Christian monks, uh, are recorded uh, in Egypt in the 4th and 5th centuries, so a very early manifestation of this um, contemplative movement in Christianity. Um, that this had an immense influence, formative influence, or was the direct inspiration, really, for what we think of as Celtic monasticism. We think we're going back to, you know, 5th, 6th fifth, fifth, sixth centuries. So, <clears throat> and yet there are records, apparently, of uh, Egyptian monks uh, having come to Ireland. Uh, we know, certainly, that when... Uh, Sort of upheaval took place <coughs> in the Egyptian monastic movement about the beginning of the 5th century. Uh, John Cassian uh, <coughs> eventually moved and settled in the south of France, in Marseille, where he founded a double monastery, and Lerins, uh, just off the uh, city of Cannes, in the south of France, uh, is still a monastic island. It's still a the monastery there is a modern monastery, but it's on an ancient site. So, Egyptian and Christian Egyptian monasticism moved to the southern Mediterranean, <coughs> and uh, at about the time that Saint Patrick, or one of the Saint Patricks, um, ended up um, in the south of France after his slavery, after he'd been uh, kidnapped. And um, he was then sent to, uh, to Ireland, of course, as one of the <coughs> apostles of Ireland, although Christianity had already reached Ireland before then. Um, but there's every reason to believe that uh, Patrick would have been directly influenced by the desert tradition uh, as it had settled and taken shape in uh, the south of France. Um, and we know that, um, of course, that movement of the Egyptian monasticism to Europe then became one of the great foundation, really, of the, uh, of the Western Church and Western civilization, Western culture. From that come most of the institutions that we're familiar with, you know, the hospital, the school, the university, um, the, the hospital, even the hotel, with the idea of hospitality. So um, we should we should see this as a, a great tradition, and it will maybe help us to, to see our own place in it. It's very important, I think, for our individual spiritual journeys that we we feel and can see how we are part of a tradition. This is difficult for postmodern people, I think, because we believe in reinventing the wheel and think that we've reinvented the wheel. In fact, we're just putting bits and pieces together in a rather eclectic and sometimes a rather superficial way, without the sense of depth, without the sense that we are, in fact, uh, the, the products of a tradition, and we are also responsible for the transmission of that to our children, the next generation. And that sense of continuity is vital, of course, for the health of 
any society or family. So it's important, I think, for us um, as meditators, Christian meditators, to have a sense of the tr tradition that we're part of. And John Main uh, emphasizes this, of course. Uh, he was first awakened to meditation from the uh, when he was in the uh, Far East by uh, an Indian monk. Although he began the practice, of course, as a, as, as a Christian in order to deepen his Christian prayer. But it wasn't until some years later that uh, he was able to recognize in the writings of Cassian, in the teachings of those early desert uh, fathers and mothers, um, the, same, the same practice that we do have within Christianity, the tradition <coughs> of contemplative prayer, that is, that can be employed and integrated into the lives of, of any kind of person in any form of life. Uh, this is both a recovery of a tradition, but also something of a development of it. And uh, this is after a, a long period of neglect of the contemplative uh, dimension of uh, Christianity and Christian faith was became marginalized and specialized and kind of al almost withered on the branch, you might say, but uh, never completely. <coughs> so, and uh, John Lane says, you know, every time we meditate, we enter into a tradition. It's a dynamic view of a tradition that our own experience is interacting with this transmission of the spirit that is the meaning of a, of a tradition. We are interacting with it because we are we're contained and held and inspired and nurtured by uh, the past and we are also uh, part of a community. We know meditation creates community. Uh, we're part of a community that is, is the medium for the transmission of that uh, to the future. So uh, that's why I think it's interesting and helpful to, to think a little uh, consciously about this tradition that we're part of. Um, and <coughs> we're a little confused, I think, today because we politicized uh, the word tradition. It means conservative or reactionary or people who are living in the past or trying to get the past back, traditionalists. Uh, many of our churches have, have split into traditionalist camps and liberal camps. And it's, uh, it, it's a fundamental error of perception and I think and a misreading of the, of the, of the nature of tradition. Uh, and it easily happens when this contemplative dimension is lost. Then tradition does become fossilized, become something rigid and, and something easily politicized. So, um, as always, it's the contemplative consciousness that helps us to renew our perception and to uh, energize us for the transmission of, of the of the gospel. So one of the uh, aspects of uh, the Celtic tradition I'd like to focus on uh, this morning is the Anankara, the soul friend is how it's usually translated. Um, <coughs> and it's a uh, aspect of the monastic tradition that comes very clearly, directly from the Egyptian desert. And Ankara, the soul friend, is a characteristic of the Celtic monastic uh, community where uh, a monk would have a particular individual, um, and it could be male or female, because Celtic monasticism was really quite integrated, it was less frightened of women in the cloister than uh, Roman monasticism was. The Celtic monastery, if you can imagine it, was more like a little village, or perhaps even Benedict's was, uh, like a little village uh, with a wall around it to, not to keep the world out, um, but to, you know, to protect it against Vikings and wild animals. But it was ready to welcome people in 
whereas the Roman cloister became increasingly the idea of excluding the world because the world would pollute it or distract it or, you know, God forbid, women would come into the refectory. Um, whereas the Celtic uh, monastic community was more like a family and actually it probably in some ways was a kind of a clan. Uh, it always amazes me here on Bear Island, you know, you speak to some of the islanders uh, and you try to work out, I've been coming, coming here regularly for some years now and I still can't get the family trees in my head at all, even my own family tree, and, um, except the immediate one. But the people on the island here have an incredible mental map rather like London taxi drivers, you know, <coughs> just know London, they have what they call the knowledge, uh, just the, the knowledge of London streets and side streets and shortcuts. And the, the, not even the older ones, even the younger ones here, some of them have a, uh, the knowledge of the, of, the, of the different families who have, um, or who live here or, or <coughs> moved away, members of whom have moved away. So uh, the family sense of, uh, of the network of, a, of an extended family is very strong, uh, I think, in Irish, uh, in Irish experience and Irish imagination. Um, I've never come across anything as like it elsewhere, so, so detailed and so vivid, you know. Anyway, so I think the, uh, some of those early Celtic monasteries were, in, were family networks and some of the abbots were hereditary abbots. Uh, some seem to have been married, um, just as you get some married Zen abbots as well. So our concept of monasticism needs to be a little uh, loosened up uh, because our, our Roman model of it is, is, is a more exclusivist one, whereas the Celtic one is more inclusive. That's maybe a little romantic, but I don't. I, I think, from what we know of the form of life, it was um, it allowed many different levels of commitment. You would have celibate monks. You would have uh, various. Uh, you would have families. You'd have people living more closely in community. You'd have people living a little bit further away uh, in solitude and complete solitude but somehow all of this held together in a family network and coming together regularly. It's a, a model of Christian community that, uh, and of church, a Christian church that I think is very relevant to us today as the old models of hierarchical and institutional church are uh, collapsing uh, around us. And uh, we probably need to open ourselves to the prospect of uh, a, a pluralism of models, different forms of church, different forms of community, uh, revitalizing the, <coughs> the Christian life. And of course creating a really much more ecumenical kind of Christianity than we've been used to. When we think of uh, you know, typical Benedictine medieval monastery, we think of the great buildings, the great cathedrals, the <coughs> sometimes still lived in, sometimes usually in ruins today. But there weren't any, there aren't any uh, archaeological remains on that scale of Celtic monasticism. Uh, we have the beehive huts, such as on uh, the top of Skellig Michael that I was talking about the other day. Uh, but no great cathedral buildings, no great architectural. So they weren't into the, you know, the, the big building, the big institution. So perhaps that also helps us to understand this personal element within the uh, monastic community, the relationship with the Anamkara, uh, which, as I say, comes directly from the uh, Egyptian tradition. In the Egyptian tradition, monasticism began primarily as a movement of, in, into solitude. Certainly to some degree it was a reaction against the institutionalization of, of the church after it had become a, you know, a state institution and it was 
functioning as part of the state or the imperial organization, there was a feeling that the original zeal and purity and vigor of the gospel life uh, was being diluted and compromised. And so uh, this movement began. And it was a lay movement, remember. Even St. Benedict was not a, a priest. St. Benedict would not have had daily mass in the monastery. Actually, we might have mass this evening, having mentioned that. Um, but it wouldn't, probably didn't, almost certainly didn't have daily mass. Um, and <clears throat> if priests joined the monastery, he would welcome them, but he and would respect their priesthood. But, uh, you know, said to them, you know, don't, don't uh, get too proud about being a priest, or you're just a monk here. And uh, we'll respect you, and we're grateful that you're here. You can say Mass for us, but you are uh, a priest. I mean, you are a monk first. So, um, the early Christian monks, men and women, moved out into the desert uh, in a combination of solitude and community, but driven, first of all, perhaps by the, the personal drive to conversion. It wasn't so much joining a monastery, it was going on the monastic quest and then finding other people who were on the same quest. And that's a, it's a little different from joining an existing institution, uh, go, actually going out into the desert on your own and discovering that wonderful discovery that there are other nutcases like you who are seeking for the same thing and forming a community uh, in that way. And the fundamental building block, really, of the Egyptian desert experience <coughs> was um, the relationship with the Abba or the Amma, the, the spiritual father or mother. And these were not um, gurus in our ordinary sense of the word, or the Eastern sense of the word. Um, they were, um, they were Christian teachers, <coughs> but Christian teachers with a particular gift uh, to share. They were not celebrity teachers, seekers, although some of them did become famous, but they usually ran away from fame. Um, they wouldn't have been happy about television crews coming out to interview them. Uh, and in many of their life stories, you see them moving further into the desert to get away from uh, you know, uh, their fans. So, but the relationship with the, with the Abba, the ordinary Abba, who was not necessarily uh, well known, was one that was vital for the formation and the uh, development of the individual monk. The typical exchange is the young, or the new monk, could be young or old, comes to the elder, who's been there longer, and says, Father, Mother, give me a word by which I may live. And the word, word, here denotes not just spoken words, but an actual transmission of insight, of energy, indeed of love, really, uh, a personal communication uh, from one soul to the other uh, that brings with it strength, encouragement, inspiration. So it's a word in the sense of the word of God, something alive and active, an event really, that, um, that recharges you and you know, helps you to get over your discouragement or your tiredness or your depression or your feeling of making no progress and it just, well, we all need it, don't we? We all need it. We get it from somewhere in our lives, we have to <coughs> get that. So, um, that's, the, that's the typical exchange, really. And it is recorded, that they are recorded in uh, collections of the sayings of the Desert Fathers. This is 
one of them in <coughs> Penguin Classics. And um, they are short little chapters, usually, sometimes just two or three lines. Um, I'll just take one totally at random. I had a few, but just maybe it's fairer to take one. Oh, okay, this is a funny one. On a journey, a monk met some nuns. When he saw them, he turned aside off the road. There's a lot of misogynism, the fear of women in well, all monastic groups, all male groups probably, uh, including politics, business, the boardroom <laughs> and other institutions. Um, and the desert stories uh, describe this fear of women quite, uh, usually quite amusingly, and, and always correcting it. You know, this is a, a patriarchal society on the whole. Um, strong, this is a patriarchal society, but very conscious of this danger of misogyny and the fear of women. So on a journey, a monk met some nuns, and when he saw them, he turned aside off the road. It must have been good looking nuns. <laughs> and the abbess said to him, the abbess, so the woman in charge of them, she said to him, if you had been a true monk, you would not have looked to see that we are women. There's <laughs> 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 uh, uh, one just. Uh, hmm? Anyway, they said of one hermit that he sometimes longs to eat a cucumber, which I think is regarded as rather well a luxury. So he took one and hung it in front of him where he could see it. He was not overcome by his longing and did not eat it, but tamed himself and repented that he had wanted it at all. <laughs> so these, are, these stories you occur, you take them too literally and you, you, you approach them too judgmentally, you, you miss the point of them. Um, that they are, this one is about learning to control your appetites and having the strength to exercise some self-discipline to do it. Um, so, anyway, that's the kind of, that's how we've received the, uh, the wisdom of the desert, not through uh, great treatises or uh, books on theology, but through these stories and these, these exchanges. And they're still a very living and powerful uh, form of spirituality for us today, I think. Um, <clears throat> In the beginning of Word into Silence, Father John's first book, which I'm sure you've all read, um, in the very first uh, couple of paragraphs, he says something that, um, that most, I think, readers forget or don't quite know how to compute or which he, he says, uh, the, I hope this book will help you to find a teacher. Um, because this is a journey, meditation, in which we need a teacher. Now, that's different, as I said, from the Eastern idea of the guru. The Christian teacher is one of the charisms of the spirit that St. Paul describes gift of the spirit to be to be a teacher um, is always derived directly in the Christian understanding from the person of Jesus Jesus said call no one a teacher except the Christ so oh, that's the end of the <laughs> uh, so uh, any concept of a Christian <coughs> teacher is linked directly to the person of Jesus and in, in, is a manifestation of our relationship with Jesus in discipleship. The Christian is a disciple of Jesus. Disciple is one who learns and you learn from a teacher. And the teacher will teach you, is a good teacher, will teach you according to your capacity. He, will, he or she will measure uh, the knowledge uh, that you are being given according to your capacity. You, know, you don't start off young children with, in mathematics with 
I don't know, advanced physics. So uh, a teacher is, is very much focused upon the personality, the capacity, and the stage of development of the, of the student. It's a personal, person-centered relationship. It's not indoctrination. <coughs> it's not brainwashing. It's not even training in the ordinary sense of, of, our, of the word. It's, it's, a, it's a very intimate and personal relationship. If you think, who, who have been the teachers in your lives? Let's call them to mind. Who, and now you might think of good teachers and bad teachers. Because the teacher-disciple relationship is quite a, a powerful one. It's a power relationship in some way, and therefore power can be abused. Teachers can be manipulative, they can be uh, possessive, they can be jealous of their students sometimes. Um, but a good teacher is one who wants to share everything he or she knows with the student and is delighted, in fact, if the student surpasses them. And I've, I've met, you know, academic uh, uh, teachers who have really, I've, I've seen it in them, a joy that their former PhD students or so on have gone on to greater things than they were capable of. And it's a beautiful relationship. And it's actually, it's a manifestation of the same relationship that you find in many of the Desert Father stories. Um, if I can give you an example of that somewhere. <coughs> oh. I don't think I can, unfortunately. Um, anyway, there are stories where the, um, the, the, the Abba is <coughs> teaching guiding the, the, the younger monk over a period of time. And then in, there's an exchange or there's a crisis in which the, um, it becomes clear that the disciple has achieved maturity. And the older monk acknowledges this. One of the sayings, he says, I, I was your teacher, now you are my teacher. This is a Christian idea of the teacher, in which we are not clinging to a fixed relationship because the relationship itself is held within the person of Christ. We are all disciples of Christ. And, in, and it's a dynamic um, relationship, therefore, which can, in which roles can be exchanged in a quite wonderful and beautiful way. The, um, this is, the idea of the Anankara in Celtic monasticism is often described in terms of friendship. And I think this is implicit in the desert father's relationships as well. It's a friendship that derives from Christ, who calls us his friends at the Last Supper. And the Gospel of John, he says to the disciples, I call you servants no longer, because I have shared with you everything I have learned from my Father. That's, that's the teacher. A good teacher holds nothing back. Doesn't hold any bit of knowledge back in order to keep power over the disciple. The only, the only thing the teacher has to do is to try to adjust the flow of knowledge or the flow of his transmission uh, so that it doesn't overwhelm the, the disciple or frighten the disciple. That's the art of teaching. You know how to, how to challenge or how to push, but not to overwhelm because people easily get discouraged. So, so Jesus here is, is describing a form of spiritual teaching which is really quite new, I think, in human religious uh, understanding 
based upon a friendship in which we share everything. Then he says, I call you servants, no longer I call you friends, <coughs> because I have shared with you everything I have learned from my father. Now, what is friendship? Friendship is a relationship in which you can share with your friend. There are different levels and degrees of friendship. In the ancient world and in Christian uh, literature as well, there was a, a, a great deal of interest in the meaning of friendship, the nature of friendship. A life without a friend, uh, Aristotle said, is not worth living. <coughs> and yet to, uh, and we all need friends. Uh, if you're on Facebook, you may have 989 friends, because <laughs> a few of you never met and never will meet. But it looks good, perhaps, when you sign up and you see you've just made another 600 friends. But the kind of friends we're speaking about uh, are very few. Lucky if, are you if you find one in your life. And someone, and I think in the Christian idea of marriage, uh, this, the, your, your spouse, your partner, uh, can, can be this friend. It, that wasn't the opinion of the ancient world, of course, where women were not regarded as capable of friendship, because they were women. But in the Christian idea, we should, uh, where women were given much more respect and equality than in the pagan world, so don't be too hard on St. Paul. Women, women would have got a much better deal in the Christian church than they would have done in the pagan world. And uh, they, um, they were capable of friendship. And it was the monastic movement, actually, interestingly enough, that produced the theology of marriage <coughs> and saw marriage as a loving, personal relationship, not just a socio-economic contract. Uh, a lot of study on the monastic literature on marriage. You wouldn't have thought that that's where it would come from in the Middle Ages, but it, it is. And I think it came uh, from the monastic movement because of their experience of friendship. So there are different forms of friendship, different levels of friendship. And do we have someone in our life with whom we can share everything. With whom, to whom we can go and share the most secret, the most shameful, the most embarrassing, the most stupid aspects of ourselves. Well, that's what the desert was about, that's what the desert relationship was about, and that's what the Anankara is. Someone who is another oneself, which is how um, the Greeks understood a friend, another self, another oneself. And it's very rare, as we know, because, and that's why we have to, we have to grow in our capacity for friendship because it's uh, a big risk to, to do that and you can't do it on Facebook and you can't do it after a couple of dates. It's something that has to grow. So this is the real dynamic, I think, of the Anankara. It's a relationship that is intimate, that of course respects boundaries, but in which boundaries are not divisions and where there is complete and unconditional trust. And so even Saint Benedict, well, say even, but Saint Benedict even says that in the monastery, a uh, different form of monastic friendship, but, um, the, 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 the monk should be able to share all his thoughts with the abbot or an elder of the monastery and dash <coughs> bad thoughts upon the rock of Christ uh, by sharing it with another person. 
<coughs> so it's a deeply intimate, personal um, exchange and relationship. Now, our idea, for example, in the Catholic tradition of confession is, I wouldn't say it, it's, a, it's a distortion of that, but it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a lesser form or it's an expression of that ideal. Or even in the desert uh, tradition, confession was usually a, um, a collective thing in the early church and still in many Protestant uh, congregations. Uh, confession is a, is a communal uh, event. You, 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 are, you share your faults or you, somebody else shares them for you. Uh, in front of the community. The Irish church developed the idea of personal confession, although our present form of it is, I think, you know, a very thin and inadequate um, um, expression of this, this idea of the Anankara. And um, there was a, a movement of some years ago in the Catholic Church, you remember it for, where the personal and the communal aspects of confession were brought together again. And um, it, which meant that, it, it, and it's still the case, if, if in the most cold and miserable church with any leaking roof, if you hold a penance service on a January evening, it will be full. The church will be full. It's the way to get people into church because they are coming with their weaknesses, with their need for confession, for their need for solidarity. And so the idea of it was, was of a general absolution, a sacramental form, where people feel reconnected, they feel blessed. Um, and then the idea was you went off and you were supposed to go to private confession sometime later to the priest uh, before the deal was finally uh, signed and delivered. But it was a very legalistic idea of absolution. Uh, but it was immensely popular. <coughs> it was really touching a uh, spiritual need in, in people. And it was banned. It still is banned. And you might ask why it seems so necessary to restrict this idea of confession just to the the one-to-one the -one, um, <coughs> Confession, not always just in the confessional box, but that idea. So the the Celtic idea of of the Anankara brings together both the com the communal reconnection and the personal uh, intimate friendship that allows a complete sharing of oneself with another. And of course, it's about equality. There's no friendship without equality. If you feel superior or inferior to your friend, then they're not really a friend. Clinging to superiority or inferiority can actually be a way of avoiding the deeper challenge of friendship. And Jesus clearly makes himself our equal by calling us his friends. It's the most challenging aspect of the Christian revelation of God. And <clears throat> this equality allows an exchange of roles and a meeting in Christ. Not submissive, but um, co 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 collaborative. Um, let me give you some examples. Well, oh, running out of time actually, but. Um, one of the other aspects of the of the Anamkara, you know, you don't choose your Anamkara any more than you would choose your therapist just by going through the yellow pages. Mm -hmm. uh, the therapist, you know, our idea of therapy, the one-to-one -one therapeutic hour, 50 minutes, is, um, is, is a, of course, an expression of the same human need to be able to share everything with another person. 
and it's more professional and more uh, what's the word? I mean, less less intimate, but well, it's intimate, <coughs> but it's professional. Whereas <coughs> an Ankara, the spiritual friend, the soul friend, is um, is not professional. It transcends the that. Um, form of identity. But the Anankara is somebody who is a role model, obviously, in some way. And um, the, but we should remember that in the Christian monastic tradition, based on the gospel, this modeling of <coughs> spiritual life is um, about coming to a fullness of humanity, not becoming superhuman, not in another version of the guru idea, which is that you are set up on a pedestal, <coughs> or in the pulpit, untouchable and apparently perfect. But the, the anamkara, the Christian idea of the teacher, or the spiritual friend, is uh, somebody who is approachable, somebody who is Touchable, approachable, and uh, and yet integrated, a whole person. And the classic example of that is in the um, life of Saint Anthony of the Desert, who was the legendary first monk of the Egyptian desert, who had one day heard a gospel in which he. Um, heard Jesus say uh, to the rich young man, go and sell everything you have, and uh, he was inspired to do that, and uh, began his monastic quest, went out into the desert, and increasingly uh, into deeper parts of the desert, into solitude, but always in touch with people, and after some years there, he uh, decided he needed to make a, a retreat <laughs> and so he had himself walled up or he walled himself up in a fort in the desert and just asked his friends, he said I'm going to a long retreat which was 20 years so don't think your 10 days is <laughs> so great and cheap <laughs> So he walls himself up in the desert in this fort for 20 years and his friends bring him bread and water and leave it for him. And after 20 years they say, look, enough is enough. Uh, you know, he's probably, if he's not dead at least, you know, he's probably completely gaga by now. So we should, uh, we should go in and uh, rescue him. And this is what they find. Anthony spent 20 years in the desert in this way remaining cut off from the sight of men. But many came to him in their desire to imitate his commitment to that way of life, together with a large number of those who knew him, so friendship. Even though he was off in this solitude, he was still held in love by his friends. And um, they gathered there a great crowd of people who were suffering so the Anankara uh, attracts suffering for people who are suffering, just as Jesus did. When they had at last managed to tear down the doors by force, Antony appeared to them. So what do they see? He appeared to them with an aura of holiness as if he had emerged from some divine sanctuary. They were all stunned at the beauty of his countenance and the dignified bearing of his body, which had not grown flabby through lack of exercise, neither had his face grown pale as a result of fasting and fighting with demons. On the contrary, the handsomeness of his limbs remained as before, as if no time had passed. What a great miracle! 
Mm. You might agree with that. What purity of mind was his? Never did excessive frivolity cause him to burst out laughing. Never did the thought of past sins make him frown. Nor did the high praise bestowed on him by his admirers make him conceited. Solitude had in no way made him uncivilized. And the daily battles with his enemies had not brutalized him. His mind was calm and he maintained a well-balanced attitude in all situations. Then the grace of God, through Antony, freed many people from unclean spirits and from various illnesses. His speech, seasoned with salt, brought comfort to those who grieved, instructed the ignorant, reconciled <coughs> those who were angry, <coughs> and persuaded everyone that nothing should be valued higher than the love of Christ. He would set before their eyes the great number of future rewards, as well as the mercy of God, and he made known the benefits granted because God did not spare his own son, but had given him for the salvation of us all. His words had the immediate effect of persuading many of those who heard him to reject the material things, and this marked the beginning of the desert's colonization. So that's we see we see there the, the model of the Ankara, but also that it's a model <coughs> for us all. The result or the purpose of our asasis, of our prayer, of our exercise, of the discipline of meditation, uh, is this integration and health of body, mind and spirit. And remember, you know, the emphasis upon the, the physical wellness of Antony, his handsomeness, mm -hmm. his, his uh, nice complexion, his, um, his, his balance of body and, and uh, his calmness of mind, uh, his moderation, his centeredness, um, his modesty, um, his civilized behavior, um, and, uh, and his openness uh, of, of self um, to cure the sick, to console the sorrowing and to reconcile the divided. So this is the, that's clearly the goal of the monk. And the monk, remember, is someone who seeks God, truly seeks God, is on that quest. 